Just take a moment to pray that the Lord would send his spirit to attend to the preaching of his word and to the reception of it. I don't know about you guys, but I need the helping of the spirit today to preach, and I know that we need it to receive it too. So just quietly where you're at, if you would just ask God to do that for us right now. Father God, I'm always very thankful for the prayers of your people. Lord, as we come before you this morning, may it be that we are still and know that you are God. May it be that we see the beauty and splendor of Christ and his submission, his humanity, or his condescension at this time, Lord, lowering himself in all regards, knowing that you are fully in control, knowing that he was sovereignly in control of what was happening in this garden, in this arrest, the scriptures would be fulfilled. He had meditated He knew these things to be true. So, Father, help us to also do the same. Thank you for the model that we have in Christ this morning, Lord, and always, that we would follow closely behind him in these chaotic times and every day, Father, in the good, the bad, no matter what. You give, you take away. Blessed be your name, Father. We thank you for the time you give us this morning. I would ask, Father, please, that you would give me clarity of mind and speech, Lord, and that your people would be strengthened, edified, and be looking to Christ for all that they need. So I thank you again for this morning, Father. Please remove our sins. Father, forgive us our sin this morning. Pardon us of these things, Father, that encumber us and stumble us. And let us now focus upon you and upon your word. May it be life to us. May it be sweeter than honey. So, Father, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of our mouth be acceptable in your sight, please. How I ask for your blessing. For your glory and for our good, I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Last last week, we saw Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, his disciples, and their strength fell asleep. Remember what we said last week, it's good to eat and to sleep. Everybody went and did that last Sunday, right? You went home, you ate, and you slept because you felt good about that, and you turned on the TV and did the things that I instructed you to do, right? And you followed the disciples' model. Everybody's like, yeah, we did that, we did that. But we saw in the garden, we saw Jesus in his humanity, In that garden last week, we saw Jesus coming in humble and human. He stepped into the garden. Remember I said if he had interrupted that with any form of his deity, it would have been uh, been an interruption in what he was doing in the garden. He was showing himself to be human, pleading with the Father, pleading in prayer three times while the disciples slept in that. So we see the importance of prayer in that as well. Jesus was one who prayed. We're to pray at all times. Does everybody pray without ceasing? Everybody doing that okay? Pray without ceasing. Have you ever thought about, how do I pray without ceasing? We're instructed in, in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, right, to pray without ceasing. You're to pray without ceasing. Are you meditating just on the fact that you can commune with God at any moment? He hears your thoughts. You can be praying all the time. I had this, this illustration one time. I was in Safeway stacking uh, uh, grapefruits, right? This is like mundane work. You're filling this whole thing. And then somebody comes by and pulls the bottom one off and the whole thing falls apart, right? You're just like, really? And it's a little old lady, so what are you going to do? You know, you're just like, ah, but just the mundaneness of doing that all the time, right? I'd build a little perimeter, and then I would just take a whole case, and I'd be throwing them up in the air, and they'd be falling into this little thing, and I'm like, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, I've got nothing better to do than to pray. You know, I'm just thinking about God, creation there, while I'm stacking these grapefruit on this thing. I'm just like praying without ceasing. It's just you're thinking about God. You're meditating on God's word, right? That's praying. That's a form of praying. You're just thinking about God, his creation, and all the things around you. And you're meditating on God's word because you've read God's word, right? Every morning you wake up and you're excited to read God's word, to fill your hearts and minds, and so you meditate on those things, right? That's what Jesus is doing in the garden. Remember, I I pointed you guys forward to today's sermon in verse 56, where it says, how are the scriptures going to be fulfilled? When he was in prayer with the Father, he was thinking about the word of God. He was thinking about the things he was going to fulfill. He was praying and thinking and meditating upon God's word. So we saw the importance of prayer, and we also looked at just his model in that, that during that time of prayer, one of the things we looked at was that you're praying to God the Father. You're recognizing who you're speaking to, right? You're coming to God the Father through the name of the Son, empowered by the Spirit. Think about that again. You're coming to God the Father. You're addressing him as Father. You're using the name of Christ because you're coming to him in the name of Christ. You're empowered by the Spirit of God to do that. That's beautiful, isn't it? That's a Trinitarian work right there in your your ability to approach Almighty God. Remember what we said in the Apostles' Creed? We need to focus on Almighty. 
He is almighty God, and you have access to him because of the, the Trinity's effect in your life. So, again, I told you last week, we need to be very conscious of who we're coming to. He is also allowing us to call him Daddy. Just as Jesus called him Daddy, we can call him Daddy and Father. And the effectiveness of that, again, it's according to his will. Last week, I implied something. I'd like to apologize. If any of you took what I said last week the wrong way, I had said some things about the Our Father, right? That it was, if you just say it rotely, that it's not a good thing. You guys got to remember something. This is my only defense. Two blocks away from here, I grew up. I did 12 years over there at the penitentiary, okay? Anybody know what two blocks that way is? <laughs> St. Bernard's High School, okay? So I learned our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I didn't have the glory and power thing at the end of it, but you know, yours be the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, right? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sins against us. I would do it like that. And that's what I was saying. It was like, it shouldn't be that way. I should be meditating on that. Father, you are holy. You are high and lifted up. Okay, so you work through that prayer. It's a beautiful prayer. But I learned it just rotely. Guess what I learned that went along with that? Hail Mary. You know, you say five of those, and then you say one, our Father. Right? So the rosary, when you're doing your rosaries, I never, I never got catechized over there, so I just had to watch it. I never really actually participated in it. But I didn't want anybody to think what I said about the Our Father was belittling it in any way. I think it's a beautiful prayer. Jesus taught us how to pray, Our Father. I'm just saying, slow down a little bit. We'd say it fast, right? Just as little kids, little puppies over there. We just learned the Our Father and the Hail Mary. Don't say the Hail Mary, please. Okay, but we learned it so fast and so rotely that it had no meaning to me. That's all I was trying to say last week. So it's a beautiful thing. But again, it's according to God's will. We pray that God would affect his will. How do we know his will? Because we're immersed in his word. And the third thing we said last week was that we are persistent in prayer. Just like Paul was persistent. He had a thorn in the flesh, prayed three times. What was God's answer? My grace is sufficient for, for you, Paul. Right? So when God says his grace is sufficient for us, we still persist in prayer. Jesus prayed three times to the Father. Paul prayed three times, continually coming to the Father. We should do that consistently, uh, petitioning him, persistent in our prayers. And we should also expect an answer. Remember what the answer usually is? Wait. You guys, we live in a drive through world, don't we? We want an answer today. God, I want an answer today. Yes or no, but I want an answer. And he says, just wait, just wait. You're too anxious. You're too anxious. And when he, in, this, in this also, he, he illustrated to his disciples, he says, keep awake, be watchful, and be praying. And remember, Jesus is in a point of depression. And remember, we went back into Psalm 38, and we showed that in Psalm 38, we see uh, David presenting a whole issue of depression and a anxiety, right? And Jesus is in the garden. He's facing depression and anxiety. And what is the solution? Prayer. Prayer that is meditating upon God's word. So if, you, if you're in a position today where you feel depressed, where you have pressure of the world pounding down on you, where you have an anxiety attack, it's like Jesus is modeling for us the answer. The solution for that is prayer, meditative prayer. He is meditating on the word of God. He's reading the word of God and he's praying back to God. So there's a beautiful example that Jesus gives us. How do we deal with the issues at hand? We beseech our Father in heaven through the name of Christ, empowered by the Spirit, and ask him, please, according to his will, to do these things for us. Are we doing that? That's all. That was the encouragement from last week as we saw Jesus addressing his disciples in that regard and also telling them in verse 41, it says, keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And they were counting on the flesh. Again, we see that today in the text before us, that they're counting on their flesh. In Luke 22, they actually asked, Jesus, should we attack these guys? Wow, there's a 1,000 of them. There's 600 soldiers, 400 policemen, and all these other people. And they're saying, should we attack? We've got two swords. Wow. That's kind of like having a pea shooter going up against the uh, Navy SEALs, right, um, in comparison. But let's take a look at this this morning. It says, while he was still speaking, let's just stop there for a second. I'm going to stop a whole bunch of times, by the way, this morning. You don't have to take notes like you did last week where I'm going to give you 800 verses, but today I'm going to stop, and I'm just going to say this word, this word, this word. So there's a lot of places here I need to stop in the text and elaborate on some of the wording that's used here by Matthew and just kind of blow our minds with regards to what goes on here. It says, while I was still speaking, what was he speaking? Back up in 45. 
Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. And while he was still saying that, here comes this crowd. Here's Judas at the front of this, too. You think they would have understood that when Judas shows up at the front of this crowd, he's the one who betrayed them. They still don't see it. All of the gospel writers still refer to him as one of the 12. That's a great, I mean, they're not calling Judas out. The gospel writers don't call Judas out. He was referred to as the one who would betray Jesus when you see the listing of the 12 back in Matthew. But here, he's one of the 12. All the gospel writers say, one of the 12. That's a position of, of, of honor. You know, those 12 that Jesus selected, and Jesus selected Judas too. But Judas has got to be something that just piques our curiosity. Um, John MacArthur actually wrote his seminary thesis on Judas. I just found that amazing. Why would you ever write a thesis document on Judas. But he fascinated him, so he wrote his thesis in seminary on Judas. And there's some things in our notes today that I have to share with you that are just like, that kind of blows your mind completely. But here is this entire group coming, a thousand people coming to him. And I had this little delusion of grandeur, by the way, the other day. Thursday when I went home, I never thought Podunkville, McKinleyville would be the place of a protest. There were 300 people in McKinleyville protesting, you know, the Black Lives Matter thing, right? I'm just scratching my head. I'm saying, I thought we weren't even on the map. How in the world did this happen? And the street's blocked. I'm trying to get home to my wife. I'm thinking, I wonder if they're going to walk up to our neighborhood. It's less than a half a mile to Pearson Park. And they were walking across the street, blocked Central Avenue. And they did it legally. They used the crosswalk. But when you fill the entire crosswalk with people, the traffic has to stop. And I'm like, okay, so I had to turn and go around the block. I parked my big, so I'm, you got you to, gotta just, just real quick, here, here's the picture. I'm wearing a Carhartt shirt and a Fastenal hat, and I'm driving a big white diesel pickup truck. Do you think I fit in? No. But here's my delusion of grandeur. I'm thinking, black lives matter. Black lives matter. I'm thinking, life matters. I was talking to my son about how black lives are being killed right now. And 50% of African-American pregnancies end in abortion. And I'm thinking, if we really care about black lives, life in general, we would stand over there with them and say, lives matter. Pro-life matters. And so I had this delusion. I thought, they had a little speaker over there. They had little people over there. I thought, I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to tell them a story about this very text of scripture. I was gonna go over there and I was gonna say, hey, can I just have five minutes just to address the crowd just really quickly? I'd like to tell you guys, because they're all because you watch it and they're all sharing their personal experiences, right? They're all sharing, oh, I had this happen and oh, I had this happen and we need to educate our children and it's like this, this show and tell time. I'm like, hey, can I have a turn? I wanna turn, can I have a turn? And take the mic, right? So this was, I never did this. Don't worry, I probably would be in jail, I don't know. I was gonna take the mic and I say, I'd like to tell you a story about my eldest brother and my father they were having a quiet conversation in their garden, out in a garden. And there was another 11 of their friends there. And all of a, a mob shows up. It's about midnight. And an entire mob shows up, the police and the military. There's a thousand of them. And they come into the garden. And they arrest my eldest brother. And my father, he, he can't do anything. And the, and the rest of their friends, they just scatter because they're terrified of what's going on. And they take him and they, and they try him and they, they put him up on trial. And there's, no, one can, no one can bring a testimony against him, but they accuse him. And they, the verdict is guilty. And they're going to crucify him. They're going to they're kill him. They're going to kill my oldest brother. There's nothing I could do about it. I mean, doesn't this just, just enrage you? And it's call for their rage. Call for their anger. Call for their, their, their wanting to have justice, right, and peace. Call for it, right? And I said, do you know who I'm speaking of? I'm speaking of the Son of God who came to earth. He came to this planet to bring peace, which we could never fathom, and justice, which we could never fathom, and he was put upon a cross by the police, by the religious authorities, over 2,000 years ago. We need to rightly think about what matters, what really matters. And at that point, I'm sure the microphone would have been ripped out of my hand, and they would have been ejected from the park with my Carhartt shirt and my big white truck. But I just thought, this is an opportunity. This, is, this was an opportunity. So pray for me because I might do it the next time I get the opportunity. If they show up at Pearson Park again, all 300 of them, I might just go over there and say, can I have a, can I just have, a, I just want to share, share time and share something with you. Here in the garden, Jesus is in complete control. Absolute, complete control. 
That's one of the other things we need to see, but he's interrupted. But wouldn't that have been great if I could have done that? Yeah, you're all thinking that because I get to do it. You don't have to do it. Maybe one of you guys should. But while he was still speaking, while he was still speaking that here came this mob, here came this riot of a thousand people, he's interrupted. Judas, one of the 12. I, I, just, I just have to stop there again. Judas, one of the 12. One of the 12. One of those who had an honored position. Some of the apocryphal writings have some very colorful things to say, and this is in comparison. In the first century, some of the books out there uh, in the Apocrypha and other apocryphal writings, some of the books of the time, refer to Pilate. One of the things they said about Pilate was is that his parents knew that he was diabolical at a young age. So they actually threw him in the ocean or threw him into the Mediterranean. He survived somehow. He came out, and he actually later on in life married an older woman, found out that it was his mother. I mean, this is why the Apocrypha, one of the reasons why the Apocrypha is not included, right? See, there's some kind of the things. Another account, another account, and I think it's the Pilate uh, episode, the Chronicles of Pilate or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it's called. It says that Judas felt remorse after he betrayed Jesus. He went home, and his wife was cooking a chicken on the fire. He said, Jesus is going to raise from the dead. He said, Jesus always spoke about being raised from the dead. I know he's going to raise from the dead, and I'm toast. I'm going to be in trouble. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go out and kill myself. She goes... The wife, this is an apocryphal, remember, this is not biblical, this is just apocryphal writings, but this is the viewpoint of Pilate, I mean, this is the viewpoint of Judas, sorry, Judas, in the first century. The wife says, the likelihood of that happening is like this chicken in the frying pan jumping up and clucking. At that very minute, the chicken jumps up and clucks. And I'm like, that's interesting. How would that have ever happened? She's frying the chicken in the frying pan, but this is the things that you find in apocryphal writings that... You know, sick me, I find these things interesting. Um, anyway, but the viewpoint, that's the viewpoint of the first century, right? These, these are apocryphal writings. We're not including scripture. But look at the contrast. One of the 12. The gospel writers don't say anything like that about him. You don't find that in scripture. You find Judas still. He's going to commit suicide. He's going to kill himself. But here, Matthew is saying one of the 12. You also notice in this that when Peter pulls out the sword... He doesn't go after Judas. Judas is still being protected, biblically, spiritually. He's being protected in this account. That's just amazing. He's the one betraying Jesus, and yet he's still being protected. I'm just just fascinated by that. One of the 12 came up accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs. So we know that there was a cohort that was gathered. And if you look back at the time frame, guys, I told you about how you tell time in, in the calendar back then. From 6 to 9 is evening. From 9 to 12 is midnight. From midnight to 3 is the cock crows. And from 3 in the morning till 6 is morning. And so we're about at this point of the garden. We're at about midnight, just after midnight. Judas left around 9. Don't tell me. I won't want to tell you how I figured that all out. I didn't. I read it with other theologians. But anyway, so Judas has had about three hours. But he has assembled He's been able to go to the high priests and the Sadducees, get them to send with him the police force from the temple, and 600 Roman soldiers, a tenth of a, of, of a, uh, a bunch of guys. There's 6,000 in a legion, and a cohort of 600. So you've got 600 Roman soldiers, you've got a military, the, the police from the temple, and a bunch of other crowd people, and they come out with swords and clubs. Those swords were like small daggers, and the clubs were like a little billy club that the, the police would use. They're coming out to pounce on him, right? If he resists, they're going to thump him. And they got their torches and lanterns in case anybody needs to chase him down, but it's also full moon. This is in the middle of the month. Did you notice there's nothing, there's no account out here that the disciples needed lanterns or torches to get to the garden, It's as bright as the night with a full moon, and they've come out with torches and lanterns and a thousand of them to come upon this, and Judas is leading them out to capture him, who came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. And now he who was betraying him gave gave them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. You guys know what the word for kiss here is? A bridegroom who kisses his bride. I don't think this is sloppy, but the term that is used here is one who gives an affectionate kiss to another. That's the kiss, that, that's the word that Matthew uses here. Judas comes up to him, and now if Judas was a, a servant to Jesus, if he was putting himself under him, he would have kissed either the back of his hand or the front of his hand if he had gained favor. If he owed him anything, he would have kissed his feet. Remember the woman who kissed Jesus' feet because she realized the forgiveness of her sins? She was honoring him. Judas comes in, this is how despicable Judas is. 
he comes in and gives him a kiss like you would a bridegroom to his bride. Kisses him repeatedly on both sides. And if Jesus is his teacher because he says this, whomever I kiss, he is the one, sees him. Immediately Judas went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, Master, Teacher. He's recognizing Jesus as his teacher. He's recognizing that he is subservient to, to Jesus, that he puts himself under him, but he's coming in in a despicable way using this sign. And the only way that this would have been acceptable is if Jesus had first given him permission by giving him a kiss first. So Judas actually comes in and offsets the tradition, the, the, the understanding of the culture would be that the only way he could give him that intimate kiss was if Jesus first kissed him. But do you notice the disciples don't even have a clue about what's going on? They don't think Judas is the betrayer. And Jesus even just said, behold, notice this, the one who betrays me is at hand. But they don't even recognize him. He's at hand, he's right there in front of them. And he gives them this passionate kiss. So they're thinking, it can't be Judas. It can't be Judas. That's how sly Judas is. Remember, Satan had entered into him in the, in the accounting of the gospel. Satan has already entered into Judas, and Judas is effectively working from his heart out. He's working on the, de- the, the deception and the despicableness of his heart in doing this. But what a despicable thing that he's shadowing himself. He's covering this all with this by kissing Jesus like a bridegroom would kiss another. And nobody's calling him out on it. The gospel writers are still saying, one of the 12. I just find this amazing. Why are they protecting him? Why are they protecting him? Why didn't Jesus say, there he is, there's Judas, there's the one who's betraying me, get him. They had two swords. In Luke 22, we know they had two swords. And of course, we know that also from John's account in John, in the Gospel of John, that Peter's the one. They don't even call out Peter until later on in the first century when John writes his Gospel account. It says, hail rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, friend, or fellow, some of you might have a translation if you have King James, it says fellow or companion, he doesn't attribute to him the closeness anymore. He is now, these are the last words he'll speak to Judas. This is it. These are the last words he speaks to Judas. Friend, do what you have come for. Companion, fellow, what you have planned, bring it to fruition. Do what you're going to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. They came up and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached out and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. We don't know who that is. Do you guys know who that is? You wouldn't have known in the first, you wouldn't have known in the first uh, period of time and not until John writes about that. So Peter's even being protected too because we know it's Peter from John's account but written later on after the first three gospels that Peter gets called out on this and that Malchus was the one who he cut off his ear. So there's a protection also. Uh, some of the theologians that I read say there's a protection for Peter that he would not come under any scrutiny by the, the temple police as well and suffer anything in this regard to what he just did. But think about this. Why does Peter not kill Judas? Judas is the one leading this band. Judas is the one Judas is the one who's betraying him. He says, my betrayer is here. Why didn't Peter, and he's a poor shot, isn't he? he should have, he's probably aiming for the, for, the, for the head of this individual, Malchus. But he misses and catches the ear, right? Bummer. Why didn't he go for the high priest? Why didn't he go for the Roman who was leading the cohort? Why didn't he go for Judas, though? Judas would have been the one that he would have went for. But God is protecting him that the scriptures might be fulfilled, that the scriptures about Judas might be fulfilled, God is actually protecting Judas and what he's doing. That's just amazing that Judas, the despicable man who brought these, this crowd, and remember, this had, this had to be something that they forced upon him. One of the questions we have to ask is, why Judas? Why is Judas a character? What is Judas doing? They didn't want to take after Jesus during this festival. They wanted to do it a week or two weeks after Judas had to go and convince them. Remember I said it earlier about the three hours. He had to go to the temple, to the Sanhedrin, had to wake people up. He had to get this mili- the, the police force, the military. They had to have gone to Pilate at, at Fort Antonio and got the people there and roused up this crowd. And there's a festival going on. Everybody's at peace. They're wondering what's going on. And he is able to gather all this. So he had to convince them. Think about this, what deception Judas pulled off. He had to convince them, now is the opportune time. You want to do this now. We need to go now and do this. And Jesus goes, friend, do what you have come for. And they seized him. 
and behold. Now again, the, the, Matthew is saying, look at these things, take notice of these things. The word behold there is something we don't want to pass over lightly. As Jesus said it back in verse 40, 46, behold, the one who is betraying me his hand, Matthew again states this, behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached out, drew his sword, and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ears. That's why I say we needed to stop there. When it said behold, we needed to stop and think, why did he do this? We know it's Peter who did this, and he cuts off his ears. Also, in the Gospel of Luke, we also see what did Jesus do? He heals this man because it was an ear for an ear, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life in the Jewish culture. Jesus is being very gracious to Peter. Peter doesn't get arrested because he reaches out and he heals Malchus's ear. Gives him a new ear on the spot. Bam. Peter's not going to have to suffer anything because he is gracious to do that. Then Jesus said, verse 52, then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. There's an echoing into math or into Genesis. Genesis 9, verse 6. If you shed blood, by another human, your blood will be shed of you. Paul will make a point of this too in Romans 13, one through seven. He will say that the government has given that sword for a reason. So he's basically telling Peter, Peter, don't do this. You do not need to do this. Put your sword away. Put your sword away. If you take a life, your life will be required of you. The death penalty is right there before us. He's inferring the death penalty to Peter. He's saying, Peter, put away your sword. Put away your sword. We've prayed about this. Of course, Peter fell asleep. I've consulted with the Father. This is the will of my Father. This has to happen. Judas is fulfilling the scriptures. These are the things that must come to pass. I've meditated upon these things. I've meditated on on Isaiah 53, on Psalm 22, on Zechariah 11, 12, and 13. Jesus has meditated on the things that are going to pass. He's already told them, when you strike down the shepherd, the sheep are going to scatter, Zechariah 13, 7. And there's a reference there that that one speaking, God speaking, is speaking to one of deity, his son, not to a false uh, shepherd of the people. He's speaking to his son in Zechariah 13, 7. So he's already claimed in that, he has claimed his deity. He's saying, yeah, I come here in my humanity, but I'm God. God has to die for your sins. God has to pay the price. No one else can pay it. I'm going on fulfilling scripture. Peter, put it away. Put away the sword. And think about Peter. There's a thousand guys out there. There There's 600 soldiers. Really? With one little sword, you're going to take on 600 Roman soldiers? Are you out of your ever-living cotton-picking mind? Sorry for those of you who pick cotton, but that's an old saying I use quite often. Peter is out of his ever-living cotton-picking mind. he got to be. He is. What are you thinking, Peter? And again, in Luke 22, they asked, should we strike with the sword? And Peter, being impetuous does it without even get waiting for the answer. Goes out, tries to, to kill the servant. It's like, no, Peter. If anything, kill Judas. But if he does that, other things will not be fulfilled. Verse 53, or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? He's already appealed to his father. He's saying, I can do this instantly. The text here in the understanding is, I can immediately go to my father. I can immediately, just like we can pray without ceasing, every moment of every single day, you can have immediate access to his father. That's what he's saying here. I can have immediate access to my father. When you understand praying without ceasing is just like this. What you think, he sees. The thoughts you think, God sees them. The things you speak, he already saw them before you spoke them. He knows what you're doing every single day. He's with you every single day. You can have an intimate relationship with him at all times. Why wouldn't you access that? And here Jesus is saying, Peter, I can access my father right now. Immediately he will answer me. I can access him. Or do you not think I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once put at my disposal how many? More than 12 legions of angels. A legion is 6,000. Do the math. That's 72,000 angels. You guys remember last week what I told you about one angel? In 2 Kings 19, Hezekiah, and he was, he was under the, Sennacherib was coming in with the Assyrian army and he prays, and God sends one angel, and how many soldiers did that one angel destroy? 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And Jesus just said, I can have 12 legions of angels like that. Peter, put away your sword. Christianity doesn't move forward with swords. Christianity does not have uh, earthly concepts and schemes. In 2 Corinthians 10.4, Peter tells us very, very clearly, our warfare is not of the flesh, it's of the spirit. We proclaim the gospel. We take the microphone and tell people about Christ. 
We don't take swords. We don't take clubs. We don't do what the crusaders did. Boy, after I went through seminary and learned what they did, I have a hard time with my alumni now. We don't do that. Those all failed. Those all were a a travesty of the church being looked at in, in those times when they were pushing Christianity, when the crusades happened. It never honored Christ. It never worked. And here Jesus is telling Peter and his disciples, that will never work. I can call down a legion, 12 legions of angels. How then will the scriptures be fulfilled? There it is. How will they be fulfilled, Peter, if you do this? If you try and start a war with these soldiers in this policehood, how are the scriptures going to be fulfilled? There is something bigger at stake here, Peter, something much bigger. How will the scriptures be fulfilled which say that it must happen this way? It's got to happen this way. The Son of God, the Son of Man, must die for the sins of the world. It has to be this way. There is no other way. Only through his perfect sacrifice are we redeemed. Our forgiveness. When we ask for forgiveness, we should really be thinking Christ died on the cross for those sins. Given to us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. At what cost? The cost of his son's blood on a cross. It must happen this way. At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching you, and you did not seize me. Every day he sat in the temple teaching, and they recognized that he was teaching one who had authority in the temple. He is there. They've come out because they're cowards. They are cowards. They could have arrested him in the temple, but they know what they're doing is wrong. They absolutely know what they're doing is wrong. So they come out under the cover of darkness. Evil is at work. Evil, evil, evil. Evil that Satan has indwelled Judas, and now this is the working of evil, the playing out of evil. When we see the things around us in our culture today and in the world, these riots, John MacArthur makes a very good point. It's the evil of men's hearts coming to fruition. This is sin playing itself out all over the globe right now. We shouldn't be surprised about it. We should not be surprised about it because it happened 2,000 years ago right here in the garden with our Lord and Savior. This is not a surprise to God what's going on right now. I do carry a sword, though, just so you know. And I recommend that you do have a sword. But hopefully I'll never have to use it. That's another point. Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Everything that the prophets spoke are being fulfilled right before your eyes. Everything that you trusted and everything that you read in Sunday school and heard preached in the synagogues, everything that the temple looked for, everything in the Passover meal that he had just proclaimed to them was appointing to him. Everything is being fulfilled in Christ. There he is on this scene saying, this is to fulfill what the prophets have spoken about Jesus, that first must come the suffering and then the glory. 1 Peter 1.10, he says about that. He says the prophets, and it was the spirit of Christ within the prophets, proclaiming that first there was suffering and then there was glory. First the suffering of the cross, then a glory. Resurrected ascension, and now he's coming back again. We sit here waiting for his return, zealously waiting for his return. So you all go up to Pearson Park, you take the microphone, and you tell everybody about Jesus, okay? You're all just like, no, it's... Or you just have a small conversation on the side. Hey, I'm pro-life too. Are you pro-life? I'm pro-life. Black lives matter? Absolutely. Every life matters to the degree that God sent his own son. How do we value life? Because God says you're created in his image. In Genesis 9, 7, the reason why life is required for life is because you've been created in the image of God. Anybody you talk to bears the image of God. Anybody out there in the riots bears the image of God. You say, do you know that when you look in the mirror, you bear the image of God? And he has something for you. He has a son who died for you to redeem you, to give you the peace that you're seeking, to give you the justice that you're looking for. He gives, and it comes through a cross, comes through his death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension. That's the peace you're really looking for because everything here will avail you nothing. 
You will never have peace and justice here. You will only have peace and justice when he returns and judges us. And oh, that we confess that he is our Lord and Savior. Otherwise, we will suffer condemnation in hell for eternity. That's the truth of what you're looking for. That's the truth of the peace that you think you're petitioning and protesting for. That's the peace that we all need. And it's through the blood of our son. We are reconciled through the gospel of reconciliation, which comes through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, on a cross 2,000 years ago. Oh, that you would come to understand that. You're ambassadors for Christ. You make the appeal for their peace. I need that peace. You need that peace. They need that peace. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Trusting in their own flesh, they fled. Trusting in their own understanding. Trusting in a sword. Trusting in their human flesh. Trusting in their own ability, they fled. To fulfill Zechariah 13, 7. When the shepherd is cast down, the sheep will scatter. If we trust in our own flesh and blood, if we trust in our own thinking and our own understanding, if we try to come up with plans and methods and methodologies to get people to come to Christ, we will fail. It's only through the truth of who Christ is. And it's only through the meditation that we know him, being in his word. Jesus said twice, he said the scriptures have to be fulfilled. Twice he's referring to what is going on being a fulfillment of scripture. He's meditated on on the word of God, he's prayed to his father, and here it is being played out. That's our example. That's for us. Jesus knew what was coming. The disciples, they trusted in their flesh and they failed. We have to trust in the word of God or we will fail too. Let me close with just a little look back onto Psalm 19. I was listening to Wes this morning work through Psalm 19 with Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry is excellent. If you want to know how to say something really colorful, Matthew Henry, he's the guy, okay? You do your study, you look through the text, you kind of line it all out, you go, here are my main points, but I really need a colorful way to say something. You open up Matthew Henry's commentary, and he's got these colorful ways of pinpointing truth, and that's what we need today. We need that today. We need that on our tongues. We need to think about and meditate on it so that we can pierce through things in a beautiful way, in a... In a uh, Uh, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sorry. I'll remember it tomorrow after the sermon. But Matthew Henry's really good for that, okay? He has a way of cutting through all the baloney and pinpointing things. So he's really good for that. Let's just start in verse 7. Let's see. In Psalm 19, verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect. It's blameless. Restoring the soul. Is your soul troubled? Here's how you restore it. You look to the word of God. The law of the Lord is perfect. It's not not laborsome. It's It's a joy. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Well, do you want to have joy? There's how you do it. You meditate on the word of God. This psalm is beautiful. It's just telling us what to do. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. It gives you a clear perspective of what's going on in front of you. It gives you a clear perspective of the road that he set in front of you. You want to know the will of God? You read the word of God. You meditate upon the word of God. You meditate on the psalms. You pray them back to the Lord. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. Want to know what's right? The word of God shows us. They are more desirable than gold. Wait a minute. I really like gold. The dollar is devalued. Let's go buy gold. Everybody tells me, if you have a portfolio, you have to have a little bit of gold. I don't have a portfolio. I'm just seeing if you guys are paying attention. Gold is very valuable, right? Yes. Then much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. You guys like honey? How many of you guys like good chocolate chip cookies? Making everybody hungry right now. It's 12 after. It's, I love chocolate chip cookies. I love them with a little bit of honey in them, a little bit of oatmeal. Yeah, oh, never mind. I won't call anybody out. I made cookies for some people. Sweeter, that's, that's a comparison for us. God's word is more desirable than gold or the drippings of the honeycomb. More by them your servant is warned. We're warned, we're instructed. In keeping them, there is great reward. I want a reward. I want the reward that God gives. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of my hidden faults. He reveals things to us that we can fight against. We can put to death the sin which encumbers us, the things which uh, keep us in conflict or or interrupt our communion with our Savior. He points those things out to us, but it must be from his word that is done. Also, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. You guys ever just jump in to do something? Peter did. 
You just jump out there and do something. You just react, right? That's something we need to guard against. Peter did that. He did that. Presumptuous. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Yes, through the Lord. Let the words of my mouth, and this last part is very poignant. We need to focus on it. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. He sees it before you say it. He sees it before it's even on your heart. That can either terrify you or comfort you. I hope it comforts you greatly right now. He knows everything about you, and he loves you enough to give you his son on the cross for you. He knows everything about us. May they be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. There's the point. You've been redeemed. You've been called by name. You belong to who? You belong to God if your faith is in Christ. If your faith is in what Christ has done, you belong to God. Do you want him to tell you what to do now? Absolutely. I belong to you, Lord. What do you want me to do? I'm all, I'm all ears. I'm going to read your word. I'm going to pray. I'm going to go outside and I'm going to go down to Pearson Park and have a word. I don't know if I'll, I don't, I don't think I have the courage to do that. Sorry. I just look too white and too fat and it's not going to work. So seriously, come on, look at me. You think I was going to have a, you think they're going to give me the microphone? No. Anyway. Oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, bought and paid for with the blood of Christ. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you have transferred us out of the domain of darkness. Father, we do not reside here in this darkness, in this world of darkness that rejects you, that argues against you. We don't reside there. We reside in your kingdom, the kingdom of your beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Father, we thank you that we have forgiveness of our sins through the work of your son, that these things had to be this way, that the scriptures must be fulfilled, and Christ willingly laid down his life to do that. It wasn't, wasn't taken from him. He could have called down 12 legions of angels, or he could, have, he could have easily had victory. But he laid down his life voluntarily to fulfill your will. Lord, may we follow that. Father, may we follow in an understanding of what Christ did in the Garden of Gethsemane at his arrest, his trial, this whole Passion Week, everything leading up to the cross and after the cross was to fulfill your will and the scriptures. So, Father, may we be those who meditate upon your word, who come before you in prayer each and every day, seeking your counsel for the life you've given us to lead, that we would honor you and worship you and glorify you. So please, lead us in that. Lead us, Father. Convict us and show us the greatness of Christ. So I thank you for your people, Father. I thank you for their patience, and I ask that you give them courage and boldness to go into this world as ambassadors for Christ, making the appeal for the gospel. Bless us all, please, in this regard. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.